Oh, signal, signal, maybe. Hello, testing, one, two, three, there we go. All right, great.
Okay. Yeah, you yeah. could go ahead and talk. Okay. You're in back here. Sound check, 10, 9, 8, 7. Is the volume okay? Ooh. Hello. Sound check. Okay.
Welcome to the University of California, Riverside. In an effort to make this performance enjoyable for all our audience members, we ask that you turn off all cell phones, text messengers, pagers, and electronic watches. Recording of any kind is not permitted. Also, in case of emergency, please take the time now to locate the emergency exit nearest to you. Thank you. On behalf of UCR's College of Natural and Agric Agricultural Sciences, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the 2019 Science Lecture Series at UC Riverside. I am Jose Butka, the Divisional Dean for the Physical Sciences and Mathematical Sciences. The theme of this year's lecture series, which is the 12th <clears throat> since the series began in, oh, in 2009, the first generation science. The series will consist of four lectures from prominent UC faculty who were first generation college students and went on to become leaders and change makers. A distinguished chemist and dean, an eminent nematologist and chair, and two Nobel laureates from the fields of physics and chemistry who have joined our faculty this year. <clears throat> Both the science and the stories behind the science will be explored. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the sponsors of the series. First, the UCR College of Natural and Agricultural Sciences, and second, 91.9 KVCR, our NPR local radio station. And if you're not a member, I suggest you join. I would like to take a moment and acknowledge a few people in the audience. First, Cynthia Lareve, Provost and Executive Vice Chancellor. Second, UCR faculty, staff, and students, and alumni. <laughs> students, faculty, and teachers from local universities, community colleges, high schools, and middle schools. <laughs> and community members and friends. Please. And I would like to acknowledge the College of Natural and Agricultural Sciences and amb Science Ambassadors who are serving us as, uh, uh, as ushers tonight. They are in the blue shirt, polo shirt, sorry, at the back and uh, throughout the room. These are some of our top undergraduate students who assist the college in many ways and including community outreach activities such as these. To introduce tonight's speaker, please join me in welcoming UCR's Provost and Executive Vice Chancellor, UCR alum, and first generation chemistry professor, Cindy Lareve. Thank you, Professor Wutka. So it's a great pleasure to see all of our friends and community members here this evening and also a pleasure to introduce to you tonight's speaker. Dr. Barry Barish is a Nobel Prize winning physicist who jo had joined the UC Riverside faculty in 2018. He is a California Institute of Technology, Roland and Maxine Linde, Professor of Theoretical Physics and Mathematics, Emeritus. Uh, he received his bachelor's and doctorate in physics at the University of California, Berkeley, in 1957 and 1962, respectively. Following his graduate work, Dr. Barish began his career in high energy physics as a research fellow at Berkeley from 1962 to 63, before becoming a research fellow at the California Institute of Technology in Pasadena. He has received numerous prestigious international awards in recognition of his scholarly work. Among them, he is a member of the National Academy of Sciences, which awarded him the Henry Draper Medal. He also, from 2003 to 2010, served as the presidential appointee to the National Science Board. He was awarded the 2017 Nobel Prize in Physics for, quote, decisive contributions to the laser interferometer 
Gravitational Wave Observatory, LIGO, detector and the observation of gravitational waves. And I know we'll learn a lot about that this evening. He shared the, that Nobel Prize with American physicists Rainer Weiss and Kip S. Thorne. Beginning in the 1970s, the LIGO detector was developed to record gravitational waves. And Dr. Barish had a leading role in the LIGO project and beginning in 1994 made crucial contributions to the development of this detector. In 2015, gravitational waves were detected for the first time since Albert Einstein's predictions over 100 years ago. Dr. Barish did not invent the technology used in LIGO, uh, but he improved it and refined it by an unimaginable degree. In the same way, uh, we can think of Galileo did not invent the telescope, but he had the insight and ability to use the technology available to him to probe the universe. Both Galileo and Dr. Barish have opened new eyes in the sky. Uh, there are also points of contrast to this analogy. Dr. Barish had to get an enormous amount of funding, which required perseverance and many hours spent convincing many people that this was an important experiment for the world to do. Uh, in contrast, Galileo's funding requirements were minuscule, but on the other hand, Dr. Barish does not have to fear being burned at the stake by the Inquisition. <laughs> As one of our newest faculty, Dr. Barish is making many valuable contributions to UC Riverside. His experience leading an international collaboration involving over a thousand scientists is not only an inspiration to our faculty, he can offer invaluable advice about how to pursue, manage, and, and be, make successful large-scale collaborative projects. Dr. Barish, who is also a first-generation college student, is a, a role model for our undergraduates and graduate students, and he's even involved in teaching uh, in freshman physics and into our, our graduate course. So it's with great pleasure that I introduce to you Dr. Barry Barish, who will present uh, to us his talk, Gravitational Waves from Einstein to New Science. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure for me to be here. Uh, I've been now officially at Riverside since the fall. Uh, but today has really been my initiation because I uh, taught my first class three times today. So, <laughs> three different classes. I'm teaching a class that I always dreamt of teaching, but somehow never did, on the frontiers of physics, kind of my view of where physics is and where it's going, uh, which means there's no textbook, there's no history of somebody doing it. So it was a great dream, but it turns out to be a lot of work, but I hope a lot of fun. <laughs> So I taught three hours in a row today, so I might seem a slightly hoarse. Uh, that's because I live in Santa Monica, and they're kind enough to let me, instead of teaching Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, teach uh, today with 10-minute breaks, 10 a.m., 11 a.m., 12 a.m., 12 p.m. And now I'm here. So anyway, reading the brochure for this, uh, the words that were emphasized were that every scientist or these kind of scientists or something have a story to tell. So I took that as an instruction and I'm going to tell this as a, in a story-like format. And uh, I'll start, I hope this works, I'll start by actually going back before Einstein, which is the part that matters the most, and talking about something that we all grew up with, and that's uh, Sir Isaac Newton. Newton, uh, I went one too far. Newton is the, the source for all of us in this audience somewhere in elementary school or something, uh, being told what gravity is. And what we were told is that uh, two objects attract each other and maybe even the elements of the formula that Newton wrote down in the Principia, which I wrote here, for universal gravity you learned that the force was inversely proportional to the square of how far away the 
two objects are and the product of the masses of the two objects and some constant of which defines how strong gravity is. And that's the force. And they attract each other. And we all learned that. We learned and our teacher told us that if we jumped up, the Earth pulled us down. And Newton's theory is, I think, arguably the most successful theory of physics ever. Uh, and uh, it lasted more than 200 years before we basically got what I would call an upgrade by Albert Einstein. That's basically the way science works. It doesn't mean Newton was wrong. I'll point out where the upgrade matters. It doesn't mean that Newton's wrong. It means that we learned more about gravity and incorporated it in a different way in a new theory. Everything that Newton did was correct. In this formula, there's the big item G. And since in this talk, I'm going to talk about the fact that I'm going to make a lot of excuses why, but it took us 100 years to detect gravitational waves. I'll point out that it took 100 years to determine what this G was. And that's a long time ago. So uh, Newton wrote down this formula. It worked for everything from the tides to the planets going around each other to the apple falling out of the tree. So he called it universal gravity. And he wrote it in the Principia. The Principia is the same book where he wrote down the scientific method. The scientific method being something we don't exactly follow formally, but it's the way a scientist thinks about finding the truth. And maybe it would help if our society used it a little bit more. But, uh, but we know kind of how to discern how true some statements are by what we call the scientific method, which was given to us originally by Newton. So anyway, 100 years later, this man came along, Henry Cavendish. And he figured out a clever way to measure how strong the gravitational pull really was, this big G that was in the formula. And he made a, a picture that I have here. It's called a torsion balance. It's a rod. And on the bottom of the rod, there's a rod across. And if you twist it, it tries to restore itself. So he basically twisted it, restored, twisted it, and figured out how big the restoring force is on it, and then brought up two lead balls. The, the, two, the two lead balls, when he brought up, then moved, the, moved at a certain distance, and he knew how much force that was. And from that, 100 years after Newton, he determined this constant. And it was really clever and really accurate, because I show here his measurement done in the 1700s, 6.75, 10 to the minus 11. Forget the units that we physicists use. But in the same units measured today by the best measurements that are done, it's essentially the same. A few more decimal points, but it's essentially the same. So this was a science problem that nobody could do for 100 years, and then he did it fantastically well. The next person in the story uh, is this man. Urban Le Verrier. He was a Frenchman and a mathematician. And uh, he became famous partially because he was theatrical, which I'll mention. Uh, and he had been dubbed as the father of celestial mechanics. Celestial mechanics is understanding the orbits and motion of all the planets and moons and so forth and so on. So he was a mathematician that calculated all these things. And, uh, but they, he didn't get to be the father from doing that. It was from something he did. And that was uh, he noticed that somehow there was something wrong with the calculated orbit of Uranus around the sun. And the calculated orbit of Uranus around the sun was wrong. And rather than saying then Newton must be wrong, there must be something wrong with Newton, he did the difficult mathematical problem of inverting the problem and figuring out that the reason the orbits weren't quite right is that there was a missing planet. And he calculated where this missing planet had to be to make the orbits the way they're observed. <coughs> and at that point, he knew what he wanted to do. As I said, being theatrical, he figured out a name for it. And he wrote a letter. So rather than announcing something, he wrote a letter. 
He was in Paris. He wrote a letter to an astronomer in, in uh, Berlin. He gave five days for the letter to get from Paris to Berlin. And at that point, the astronomer that he knew that trusted him, I guess, he told him where to look up in the sky. And he would look, if he looked up in the sky, he would see a new planet, which uh, Urban Leverrier called Neptune. And he looked up in the sky, and within one degree, he found this planet. So that was pretty astounding. And so uh, he became the father of celestial mechanics, and everybody uh, respected him very much. This was about 1825. By about 1850, his calculations got even more sophisticated. And he realized that the planet of Mercury around the sun, Mercury is our closest planet to the sun, and it's very elliptical. It goes around the sun and then goes way away and comes back. And each time it comes back, I'll show a picture of it in a while, it comes back to a different place because of the positions of all the planets and moons and gravitational pulls. So when he noticed that, well, this I said, when he noticed this about Mercury, of course, having succeeded once, he made a prediction. And that is there must be a missing planet or something between Mercury and the Sun. And that, uh, he also gave a name. You've probably heard the name, some of you, Vulcan. And so he named it Vulcan, and a big search started for, for Vulcan. This is about 1850s. There were several published uh, uh, assertions that people found a planet between Mercury and the Sun, but in fact, they were disproven after they, so these were just wrong findings. So all this was true until Einstein came along. So when Einstein came along, which is the next part of my story, uh, there was one and only one discrepancy in Newton's calculations or descriptions of anything that had to do with gravity, whether it's describing the tides or the moon's orbit or anything, and that was Mercury around the sun. And it's a rather small discrepancy. Uh, I said this already. So there's a book, nice book that describes the whole story of Vulcan and the prediction of Vulcan and so forth, which I just show here. Anyway, uh, I'll tell you what Einstein got in the case of Mercury. He gets the right answer, and I'll show you that. But it didn't make the dreams that maybe there's something between Mercury and the sun uh, go away. In fact, it was reinvented for this. <laughs> so the name Vilcon was used once more. This is the orbit of Mercury around the sun. It's elliptical, it goes out to a point, and it moves a certain distance. The one discrepancy that existed when Einstein came along then was that the Newton calculation from everything we knew about the planets and moons and so forth was 532 arc seconds per century is how much it moves from, I'm sorry, from uh, one time to the next. And that was off by about 10%. So that's all it was, a 10% discrepancy. Einstein came along as a scientist in about 1905. And for most physicists, 1905 is the magical year, and in the American Physical Society, it was the big celebration, the 100th anniversary of Einstein's uh, amazing contributions, which were four major breakthroughs in physics of problems that hadn't been solved in about four months, one a month that were very different from each other. And that was the big thing. He then, so you have to realize he solved these problems quickly, and that's why I'm mentioning it. And then he spent 10 years before he came out with the theory of general relativity, which is his theory of gravity. So there's a lot of speculation always about why Einstein spent 10 years on this problem. There's also a lot of truth to the fact that he didn't know enough mathematics and he needed a lot of help and he got wrong answers for a while and so forth. But still, the personality of somebody who had let's say, almost instant gratification on solving problems in 1905 to spend 10 years is a pretty big deal. Some of the histories of Einstein will attribute it to what I've shown before, the fact that he's going to fix the problem of Mercury. 
I hardly believe personally that he would spend 10 years on that problem. There are other issues with Newton's theory, too, one of which Newton really recognized in the Principia. So the two problems are the following, that in, in, and one of them I consider very embarrassing for most of us, and I'll tell you why. The, the first one is that uh, in Newton's theory, when the apple falls, you see it immediately. We have a fancy scientific term for that. We call it instantaneous action at a distance. So the action happens at a distance. You know about it instantly. But it's clear, and this was, this was clear to uh, Newton, but he didn't know what to do about it. The, if the sun burned out right now, and it was gone right now, it would take eight minutes before we would know it because that's how long it takes light to go from the sun to us. In the meantime, if the sun disappeared, it would be inconceivable that the gravitational effect would be felt immediately. In, Newton's, in Einstein's theory, which I'll come to, the gravitational signal, if you want, information travels at the same speed as the information from light, and so it has the same speed. So the, the effect that I'll talk about today, if Einstein's correct completely, the gravitational waves move at the same velocity as the velocity of light. And that uh, clearly solves a conceptual problem which Newton alluded to in the Principia in a kind of indirect way. The second problem that I consider kind of embarrassing being a scientist who's always asking questions. People ask me why I became a scientist. I said somehow because as a kid, all kids are curious and I kept my curiosity and that's what I do with my life. Uh, it's partially true, and I think it's also true that somehow we kill off the curiosity of our kids. But the embarrassing thing is that as a kid, when your teacher told you that when you jump, the earth pulls you down, were you curious enough, I was not, to ask your teacher why the earth pulls you down? Newton doesn't explain that. He gives you a formula, but he doesn't even give you a hint why there's any sort of force to pull you down. And in fact, if you look at the literature between Newton and Einstein, there are attempts to explain what pulls you down. They're completely wrong. They're usually based on electromagnetic effects, which has nothing to do with it. So basically, Newton gave us a formula that works, but no idea how the Earth pulls you down. In Einstein's theory, there's a natural explanation, which I'll show you a little bit in the pictures, and that is that you, there's words that go with it, and you've all heard the words that in Einstein's theory of general relativity, there's warpage of space and time. I'll come back to that. And it's the warpage of the space around a massive object that attracts the massive object to, the, to each other. And that's how it's done and explained in Einstein's theory. So Einstein's theory solves the two conceptual problems at Newton's theory, instantaneous action at a distance, and why you get pulled back to the Earth. Uh, I'll come to it kind of graphically in a minute. So that's kind of how science works. Newton wasn't wrong. We have a theory of gravity now that is better at explaining some things that I can even say to you that aren't too sophisticated. And it may be that Einstein's theory isn't right, and it's one of the, one of the main objectives we have in the future is to understand whether alternate theories that people have proposed since might be better than Einstein's theory. Again, not meaning that Einstein's was wrong, but science moves on and we get more and more understanding of how nature works. So anyway, uh, Einstein then came along, and I don't I write this so that you'll go home bleary-eyed. I just wanted to write the equivalent formula that Einstein has compared to Newton's. I'm not going to try to explain it in this lecture. That's the formula from general relativity. And it's nice to see a very difficult formula because it indicates that it took him 10 years to get to where he could write this, as I said. It's a very difficult concept. And it's very difficult, especially because of the fact that uh, what uh, he does in general relativity, the conceptual change is that he goes, he adopts a four-dimensional system, space, x, y, z, and time, 
as one combined system. So in Einstein's theory of general relativity, he makes uh, space and time one word. We have the word space-time. However, if I manage to try to type it into Microsoft Word, uh, they don't understand yet and think I've misspelled. So, uh, so space-time is one word. That's what Einstein's theory is. This is the picture that describes what I was saying. If you have the Earth around the Earth, it distorts the space around it. It's more complicated than what I've shown here. You can think of this like a trampoline. I put a mass on a trampoline, and it'll change the shape of the trampoline. The difference is, in this case, I've shown kind of a two-dimensional object. I have to work in three dimensions. But also, each of the points here is distorted in not just what you see, but also in the third dimension and in time. So that's the distortion that happens. The rest follows by the formulas and how to uh, how to uh, determine the, the phenomena that happen. So Einstein has this new theory combining space and time together and uh, explaining how the gravitational pull works by this picture here. He then, uh, I explained this already, the eight minutes, so I'll skip that. Uh, so he then made a new prediction. So if you're going to have a new theory of physics, the first thing that should happen is if there was some, there's probably some motivation of something you couldn't explain before. Uh, he did that. Two things that I mentioned. One was the uh, instantaneous action at a distance, the eight minutes it takes from the sun. And the second is to tell you what it is that pulls you down when you jump up. So he fixed or improved two explanations. But if a theory is really worth adopting as a new theory and uh, uh, gi giving up on the old theory, especially one as successful as Newton's theory that lasted more than 200 years, it should do more than that. So in physics, we usually expect that it may fix an old problem, but it also should predict something new. In this case, Einstein made two new predictions. The first one is shown in this picture here. And that is, if you take a source, say be, there's the sun and the earth, the moon, and if there's a source of stars, if the light from those stars grazes the sun, it'll move into this region where space has been distorted by the sun, and the ray won't follow a straight line. Einstein recognized that. And so what he did was, whoops, wrong direction. Oh, I am the right direction. So what he did was, uh, was to calculate, shown in this picture on the right, what happens in a particular case. He knew that in 1919, he made this prediction in 1915. He predicted that in 1917 first, there would be a full eclipse of the sun that could be viewed from uh, Eastern Europe and what was becoming the Soviet Union at that time. And he talked some scientists into going on an expedition to look for what I'll describe in a minute. They got arrested because their equipment was thought to be maybe something to do with uh, fighting the revolution that was happening. And it was hard to get them back. But he had a second fallback one, which is that you could look at an eclipse of the sun that would happen two years later, which was 1919. In 1919, there was an eclipse of the sun in the southern hemisphere. And a British scientist named Eddington uh, put together an expedition to go to the Southern Hemisphere to look and test whether Einstein was correct. In this case, there was a, a star cluster called the Hyades uh, star cluster that would move behind the sun just as it was eclipsed. Why do you need an eclipse? You need an eclipse because the sun is so bright, you need to black it out to see this bending of the light. So that's the idea of why you pick an eclipse of the sun. And Einstein calculated and predicted exactly how much the light would bend. Eddington then took this expedition to the Southern Hemisphere. He uh, measured and indeed found that there was a, a bending of the light. And in fact, the amount was just as Einstein had predicted. By today's standards, it wouldn't, his, his paper, which I've read, 
uh, wouldn't be published, I think, because we have so many high standards about statistical significance, which wasn't even in this paper. But nevertheless, it was absolutely correct. It was duplicated uh, several years later. So in 1919, Eddington proved that the light bent. This was kind of a romantic concept and was picked up by papers all over the world. And uh, Einstein subsequently became a household name, not as a result of his great work in 1905, but because he predicted that light bent and how much it bent and indeed was correct. And so in 1920, he became uh, a household name. OK. This is actually the article from the New York Times at the time he saw the bending of light. So you can, if you read just a little bit of it, you see that they, this was had kind of given a romantic uh, viewing of this crazy scientist predicting that light would bend in this uh, uh, situation. So anyway, Einstein became famous. The bending of light has become, as often happens in science, a tool. So we now use the fact that light bends to do a lot of astronomy. We watch, I show in a picture here, that you can see a dark object or objects where the source is behind because it goes past an object and it comes and we can calculate it well now. So we have what we call gravitational lensing. It's a very popular concept in science. So in astronomy, one of the great tools that have been developed out of first a discovery is that you can actually do a lot of forefront astronomy is enabled by the fact that we can use the lensing feature in light that we observed in various telescopes. Uh, this is an example some of you may have or may not have seen the Einstein cross, which you can, if you're lucky, see even with, the, with, the, with your bare eyes. The other one is a picture of light bending and coming around uh, a source. So these are just two examples. The Einstein cross, which you see in, in the Southern Hemisphere, is very famous. And the, it works in the same way. The four dots are there because of, of particular ge geometric things that I won't, I won't address. So basically, that uh, uh, is the first prediction of Einstein. The second, which I want to mention, because you might start becoming lost in this discussion today, uh, and I want you to realize that even though I talked about how difficult Einstein's theory of general relativity is, uh, you use it every day. And in fact, your little iPhone has it basically built in. Whenever you use the GPS, the GPS system only works if you know and make a correction for Einstein's theory of general relativity. So let me go through that with you and just show you before I get to gravitational waves. The way GPS works is there's 24 satellites that are up in the uh, sky. And at any time, you can see four of them or six of them. Occasionally, buildings or something are in the way, and it's less, and it doesn't do as well. But in general, there's four to six that you see. And by the time it takes for the signal to go back and forth to the satellites, uh, it basically triangulizes and tells you where you are to great accuracy. And you can stay on the road, or the military can do even better because they have more accurate uh, GPS. But it wouldn't work without Einstein's equations. So let me just show you that. The first point is that these satellites that are going around are going quite fast. They're going about 14,000 kilometers an hour. And that's getting to be somewhat relativistic. And when something's going at relativistic velocities, we know that clocks are affected by that. And when you take a physics course and learn about special relativity, you learn a saying that moving clocks tick more slowly. This was a saying of Einstein's. And that's what happened. So in the satellites, because they're going 24,000 uh, kilometers an hour, the clocks are going more slowly. And in fact, it was easy to convince the Air Force that they had to make a correction for that. And it's made in the satellites itself. The second is that the satellites happen to be also high up in the sky. And in the position they are in the sky, 
there's only about one quarter as much gravity as there is on the Earth's surface. But you remember that gravity uh, distorts space and time around it. If we go up, uh, up that high, it does it much less. And so that turns out to be a correction also for general relativity. You can imagine that the uh, Air Force people aren't quite as sophisticated about general relativity. And so putting this system, GPS, was built for the military first. I think people might realize that. They resisted putting in a correction for general relativity. It wouldn't work without it. It turns out that what happens because the gravity is less is that the clocks tick more more quickly from general relativity. And in fact, the correction is much more than for special relativity. So the big correction that has to be made is this 45 microseconds per day that, is, that are made for uh, general relativity. And without that, you wouldn't be able to stay on the road, I claim. So I can't, don't have the time to do the correction for you. But the total correction, of course, is the sum of those two, 38 microseconds per day. If I put in the numbers for you and basically assume a road is 10 meters wide and ask this following simple question, how long will I stay on the road if I follow what GPS tells me and I turn off general relativity, the general relativity correction, it's about two minutes. So we would be crashing pretty regularly. Uh, so general relativity, we know, has at least a big element of truth and ability to tell us about nature. This particular application is not a serious test of general relativity. As a physicist, we divide the problem by where gravity is really strong and where gravity is really weak. And where we question whether general relativity today is the right theory is when gravity is very, very strong. There are alternate theories, and we have to sort that out. And it's one of the things that we're doing in our experiment is trying to understand how good is Einstein's theory in where there's very strong fields, that'll be near black holes, which I'm going to describe in a few minutes, instead of, uh, in this case, which is very, very weak effects, and Einstein's theory does quite well, we know that. So that's the future. Anyway, this is the prediction. I mentioned that there was a second prediction of Einstein when he came out with general relativity. It actually was a year later. And so in 1916, he wrote this paper here, which is in German. And this paper is a lousy paper, actually, but rather profound. And it's in this paper that he predicts there must be gravitational waves. How does he do it? He did, he did, he did it as only Einstein could. Although he uses fancy mathematics for a lot of what he did, this paper doesn't develop gravitational waves from what we would call first principles out of, the, out of the difficult equations that I wrote one for you. He doesn't do that. Instead, what he did is that in general relativity, you can set up the problem in different ways. And he set up the problem in a particular way, which I do for my students but won't do for you today, which basically uh, has a very strong similarity to the equations of electricity and magnetism that have electromagnetic waves. So what he did is put the, uh, look at the equations of the theory he developed, and since they looked very much different letters, but very much like the form of the equations that are used in electricity and magnetism, and in electricity and magnetism, of course, we have electromagnetic waves, radio waves, light waves, and microwaves, and so forth. He hypothesized, or made the leap, which Einstein could do, that there must be gravitational waves. And so he did it from not from first principles at all. The paper otherwise, other than making this big leap, is terrible. It has errors in it, uh, which if they had stayed, would have screwed up our measurements because there's a factor of two wrong in the strength of gravitational waves and so forth. Nevertheless, it was a seminal and insightful paper that uh, predicted there should be gravitational waves. But even for Einstein, I don't think he was sure because he hadn't developed it as a theoretical physicist from first principles. Instead, he had inferred it from kind of the general form of the theory and the equations that he had. And I'll come back to that. So he next uh, uh, 
1918, he wrote a second paper on uh, gravitational waves. In that one, he fixed all the problems that were in the first paper. So the factor of two he fixed, and so he never admitted he made any errors, he just went on, it was Einstein. So he wrote this new paper in 1918. Then he left the subject, and I'd say most physicists left the subject because this is the period when quantum physics was becoming basically the center of the field, not uh, gravity and general relativity. So for most physicists, the leading physicists of the day in the, in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, were working on quantum physics, not on this. Einstein uh, left Berlin and came to Princeton University in 1932. And he always had uh, another younger physicist that worked with him. And in 1932, that physicist was a physicist named Nathan Rosen, and, who came with him to Princeton University. And they wrote a very seminal paper that we all know on so another subject. But in 1936, uh, the two of them returned to the subject of gravitational waves. There are no other papers in between, so between 1918 and 1936. They looked at it, and of course, what they wanted to do was develop gravitational waves from first principles, instead of you know, hand-waving that it has similar equations. So they tried to do that, and in trying to do that, they developed a whole bunch of infinities. We call them singularities, but a bunch of inf infinities in the calculations. And that happens, we know that today. If I give my students a problem in general relativity, it's a difficult problem because you have this four-dimensional system where you get infinities. We call them coordinate singularities. And so you have to be able to set it up right. They ended up with these infinities when they did the calculations, got concerned and worried that this whole concept of gravitational waves was no longer right and in fact wrote a paper. So Einstein wrote a paper in 1936, uh, which was entitled, with Rosen, which was entitled, Do Gravitational Waves Exist? Pretty interesting paper for someone who had proposed that they existed 20 years before. And uh, he submitted it to Physical Review Letters. The editor of Physical Review Letters at that time was a young man named John Tate. And the editor of the journal, and journals were just changing. We have a big concept now in journals that if we submit an article, a proposed article that goes for anonymous peer review, that means it goes to another expert and it related to the field, somebody who knows about the field, and uh, they critically review the article before it's published. And in today's world, it's very standard, and usually you have a few referees on any given paper that's published. I don't know what the, when peer review started in Germany, where Einstein had just come in 1932, this is 1936, but it started in the American journals just at about this time. And uh, so this happened in 1936, and at this point, it wasn't like today, that the editor of the journal had the latitude to just publish something to reject it or to send it for review. And since this came from Einstein, you'd think in general he would just publish it, but he sent it for review. This is the, this is the log book from the, from the American Physical Society where it was written down in those days. It's a little bit blurred from the bright light, but uh, I had ac it's now past the statute of limitations and I had access to this when I was president of the American Physical Society, so we went back and looked at the log books. And if you look at the log book, these are the articles that are put in to be published by physical review letters. And the first one, the first one was just accepted by the editor. The third one was rejected by the editor without sending it out. He chose to send Einstein's article out for review. It may well be the first time Einstein ever was subjected to review. I don't know that. But what happened is that the reviewer, I've said this, the reviewer uh, looked at the problem and he understood something that we understand now when we do calculations in general relativity, that these singularities that were troubling him were artifacts. They were what I call uh, 
coordinate singularities. And so since they were artifacts, uh, you could set up the problem in a different way. He did it in a different way, what he called cylindrical coordinates, and the problem went away. So he wrote back, and remember Einstein was already world famous. He wrote back to this young editor and told him what was wrong. The editor then wrote uh, a letter which I've read but didn't re reproduce here to Einstein saying, uh, we've sent it to our reviewer, uh, what do you think of his remarks? Something very kind. It isn't the kind of letter that would be sent to most of us if we submitted an article. Uh, Einstein's reaction was uh, pretty interesting. <laughs> and this isn't an exaggeration. The picture, of course, isn't for that. But what Einstein did is get incredibly angry. He wrote an angry letter back. Well, he wrote a letter back, which I may have duplicated. Yeah. This is the letter he wrote back to a physical review. And this letter basically says that uh, uh, we never, we sent you the, our article to publish, not to send out to one of your so-called experts, and uh, therefore we withdraw the paper. And Einstein never published again in our most prestigious journal, Physical Review Letters, and he lived another 20 years. So he submitted this instead to a different journal. And that journal is, Connected was a journal that existed then, but doesn't now. Connected to an institution which many of you may have heard of or seen, uh, named after Benjamin Franklin, the Franklin Institute in Philadelphia. So at that time, the Franklin Institute in Philadelphia, a very prestigious place, had a journal. Had a journal, and so when Einstein submitted this, of course, they accepted it immediately, and were thrilled, I'm sure. And uh, luckily for Einstein. The, the process which we all complain about now, how long it takes to publish our papers, was really slow then because you had to have uh, copy editors and you had to set the type and do all this stuff to make it. So it took a long time to, to get an article ready. In the meantime, during that uh, period, uh, Einstein had a new assistant that came uh, named Infeld, a rather famous astrophysicist who was his junior partner. And uh, he was working with him, and basically the article was going to be published in the Franklin Journal. In the meantime, uh, Mr. Uh, Robertson, we now don't know the name, it was, uh, uh, was, who was the referee, who when he refereed the article was actually on sabbatical at Caltech, uh, my other institution, and uh, but he returned to Princeton, his sabbatical was over. And when he returned to Princeton, he had a conversation, not revealing that he was the anonymous reviewer, but he had a conversation about the problem with Infeld, and Infeld became convinced that uh, they had been found artificial singularities, and the next thing that happened, we don't know what Einstein did or said, but basically they did publish it in the Franklin Journal, it no longer is titled, Do Gravitational Waves Exist? Just on gravitational waves. The first sentence starts in cylindrical coordinates, which is what the referee said. And so this was uh, kind of the last and only paper that Einstein wrote in the last, next 20 years. He wrote no other paper on gravitational waves. And there's no other significant paper that was written on gravitational waves. All this is a long-winded excuse for why it took us so long as experimentalists, because we can blame it on the fact that theorists didn't really believe all this for so many years. So anyway, then the turning point for the field was, if you had to pinpoint it, I think was a meeting that was held in Chapel Hill, North Carolina in 1957. And this meeting pulled together the leading theorists in the world who were connected to the subject of general gravity and general relativity. And they met in, uh, uh, it was sponsored by a, a couple who were theoretical physicists named Bryce and Cecile DeWitt, and uh, 44 theorists were there. And at that meeting, the very first presentation, which I've read in, uh, as the paper, was by a man named Pirani, who I wrote right here. And he was a, a British, uh, theoretical physicist 
who made a very elegant presentation kind of from the heart of general relativity deriving the gravitational waves. And it's the first time anybody had actually done that. And so that started the meeting very well. And then at that meeting, it turns out, Dick Feynman was at the meeting. And Dick Feynman at the meeting had a unique way of looking at the problem, which he often did. And that is that he said, if gravitational waves really exist, a kind of what we call Gedanken experiment, a thought experiment. He said, if gravitational waves really exist, then they have to be able to transfer energy. And he drew a simple picture, which I've kind of duplicated here, which is that if I have a bar and I put a couple of rings on it and gravitational wave comes through, it presumably distorts the bar. If it distorts the bar, it moves these little rings and creates friction around them. And that friction is heat or energy or the transfer of energy. So this argument's been refined, but it was the first argument that physically uh, said that gravitational waves act in a real way. It's just not some artificial thing. And there was also the theoretical proof. So at that point, the excuses run out. It becomes a problem for experimentalists to find out if there are gravitational waves. So that's about 1960. So from 19, so it didn't take us 100 years. It took us from 1960 to 2015 to, uh, to do it. So now I'll tell you about the experimental part, and then I'll be done. So first, what are gravitational waves so that we can see how you can detect them? They're actually ripples in space-time itself. It's not like electromagnetic waves that we all know have associated with them photons. So they have an object associated with them. In gravity, that's not true. It's just a ripple in space-time. Probably the best analogy for this audience is a clear, quiet pond, and you throw a rock in, and the rock sinks to the bottom. But these little ripples, which are just part of the water itself, migrate out. So this is really distortions of just the medium itself, space-time itself. And that uh, basically is what's happen going through space if something happens like we will see. The amount is a very small number. The number that I'm going to show you is one part in 10 to the 21. I'll comment on how small that is in just a minute. But one part in 10 to the 21 is a very small number. But before I comment about the measurement, why is it so small? It's so small not because gravity itself is something so much, it's weak, but it's weak because of other things. You have big massive bodies. Why is it so small, the effect? If I had to characterize it, I'd say space, which is not empty, space is something that has uh, uh, characteristics, is like a material that's very, very stiff. It's very hard to distort space. It's in, it's in physics terms, it's young modulus or whatever terms we use for how stiff some matter is. It's very stiff. So we have a big effect, but it's hard to transmit much of it into any real big distortions in space. So the amount that we'll try to see is how much it distorts space and time. That's what our experiment is. So we're going to measure a change of length when gravitational wave goes through, and a gravi the amount that the wave makes a difference, we, in general relativity, have a little term for it, and that's the little h that's up here. So the amount from general relativity is h. It'll take something of some length, and it'll distort it proportional to its length. So the amount of the effect, delta l, is h times the length. And that's what we'll try to measure. So other than the, the talking, if we look at a picture and try to understand it, I draw the picture here. So if I have a ring here of free masses, they're free to move, and a gravitational wave went through the board, it would distort what you see in the board by making it somewhat elliptical instead of uh, circular. And the amount that it would change the radius is this little delta L over L are one part in 10 to the 21. So we have a circle, a gravitational wave goes through, it'll distort it by one part in 10 to the 21, a very small number. And uh, because it's a wave, it'll make it taller, like in this picture, and then a half a wavelength later, it'll go the other direction and make it shorter, fatter, distorted in the other way. So it's continually changing as the wave goes through. Okay. 
So uh, we can make those waves in nature by having a, we have to have something which technically we call a quadrupole moment, but basically if we have two objects going around each other uh, that are massive, then they'll make gravitational waves like is shown in this picture here. Now as an experimental physicist, at, we learn at a very young age that if you're really a good experimentalist, you want to control everything or you get yourself fooled. So you want to make sure that everything to do with your experiment is under your control. So ideally, we should do the same thing for gravitational waves that Hertz did when he proved in 1880s that there are electromagnetic waves. So the way he did electromagnetic waves in the 1880s, and we knew that there were electromagnetic waves, is that the source of electromagnetic waves is a little different than ours. It's what we call a dipole moment. And he took two charges, and he just oscillated them as a source to make electromagnetic waves. Then he went in the next room and made a receiver, and the receiver detected the radio waves, detected the electromagnetic waves. Once he detected it, he moved toward and away from the source that he had built and saw that it was wave-like. And that proved very convincingly in a wonderful experiment that there were uh, electromagnetic waves. So why should we invent something new? Let's do the same thing for gravitational waves. So that's what I'm doing here. We're going to produce our own lab and make gravitational waves. So I do it by making a big barbell and then spinning the barbell like that and putting in some numbers for how big the effect will be. So imagine that these balls on the ends of the barbell are 1,000 kilograms each. I'm exaggerating, of course, to try to make the effect as big as I can. That the length of it is a meter. That I spin it 1,000 times uh, a second. I better run out of the lab. And I go in the next room. But in this case, to see the wave-like nature, I have to be pretty far away. I've made it shorter just to make the effect bigger here. So I've said I move 300 meters away. If I move 300 meters away, the size, that same size, the number 10 to the minus 21, which I'm going to show you is so hard to measure, becomes 10 to the minus 35. So for us, following what we learned, when we learned to be physicists, we can't do it. It's 14 orders of magnitude smaller than, uh, than we want. So we have to rely on nature to give us a source that's much, much stronger. We became very lucky that there both is such a source and it's intrinsically very interesting. So we learned something. So there was a certain amount of luck because we're a long ways from being able to make a detector that would do this. So instead, we go to space. If I put the same calculations in for the black holes that we observed, and I'll show you in a few minutes. I just put the numbers in here. You can forget those. We get the 10 to the minus 21. So 10 to the minus 21 instead of 10 to the minus 34. The way we can measure that is shown in this picture here. It's called an interferometer. And the idea is that you split light, run it down the two arms. If the two arms are equal, the light will come back at the same time. And we'll, if you invert one, exactly cancel each other, which will be shown in this picture. It comes back, it'll exactly cancel. And then it reflects to this no light to this object down here. But if one of them gets slightly, one arm gets slightly longer than the other, then we can measure gravitational waves, which is shown in this picture. This is a, a typical uh, prob uh, issue in physics. It's very difficult to measure the absolute magnitude of something. If we want to know how much a kilogram weighs, or how big a meter stick is, or any other constant that we use in nature, We've got big institutions that are constantly measuring it and refining it. A big one in Paris and one uh, called the National Bureau of Standards in the US. But if we want to measure the difference between two things, sometimes we can do that incredibly accurately. We're fortunate in this case that a technique where we can measure a difference is well matched to the problem of what kind of effect gravitational waves will give, even though the effect is so small. So the idea is shown here. And the problem, if I summarize it in two numbers, is on the right side, where it says delta L is 10 to the minus 12, the wavelength of light, and delta L is 10 to the minus 12, the vibrations of the Earth's surface. Those two numbers 
are my shorthand way of saying why it took us 23 years after we thought we knew how to do this to build an apparatus uh, that would do it. We knew what we had to do, but it's incredibly hard. So what are the two numbers? The first one is how well can we make an interferometer itself? That's the interferometer is that device that I just showed you. And that measures the difference in these two lengths. We use interferometers often in something like a freshman or sophomore physics class to teach students how to do this. They do maybe one part in 50, maybe one part, maybe some good student can do one part in 100, uh, seeing what we call fringes. Uh, very good interferometers that are made for special purposes in industry to measure things. Maybe are 100 times better than that, so maybe one part in 10 to the 4. We have to do one part in 10 to the 12. So there's nothing fundamental in science that limits us. It's just all the refinements and tricks and techniques and amount of light that we had to use to get to where we could tell, to the, compared to the wavelength of the light itself, that we could see a difference in one part to 10 to the 12. That we solved maybe 203 or 205, something like that. We, we knew how to do interferometry, and that's the problem we had worked on the hardest. We thought that was the hardest problem. The second one turned out to be the hardest problem. The second one is the vibrations of the Earth. So let me tell you what that's about. We're, we are sitting here on the Earth's surface trying to do this experiment. On the Earth's surface, we know basically where the Earth is quietest. How do we know that? We know it from evolution, our ears tell us. Our ears have learned that the place where we can communicate with each other, because the Earth is the quietest, is from about tens of hertz to thousands of hertz, that band. That's, if you go to lower frequency than that, the Earth shakes like mad. If you go to higher frequency, you can't sample fast enough. You're, 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 so basically, we're limited in that band. We have nothing to do with audio. We're doing something totally different. But the feature that the Earth is the quietest in that band, which allows us to communicate with each other, is the same feature that we can use here. So we work in that band. So what do we do to try to get ourselves quieter yet? We cannot uh, use the Earth itself. The Earth moves around all the time. So we have to isolate this instrument from the Earth. So we're living here on the Earth, we're doing the experiment, but it has to be, at least in those frequencies, isolated entirely from the Earth. We do that by first a technique that we uh, developed in as sophisticated way as we can, could, but it's a simple technique that you all know. We basically built a set of very, very fancy shock absorbers. So your car has shock absorbers in it, uh, the old Model A's or D. Didn't, didn't so much, and so if you go over a bump in your car, it can't get rid of the energy. The shock absorbers take what was a high frequency bump that would make you bump up and down and transfer it to much lower frequency where it doesn't bother you, and you just feel yourself smoothly go down the road. So we made the world's fanciest, most sophisticated shock absorbers, and in fact, four layers of them it would be like having the shock absorbers in your car and then having working on it again, again, and again. We didn't get to 10 to the 12th. We got to maybe 10 to the 10th. And so we struggled for, we started working on a second technique early, but we only had these uh, shock absorbers, as good as they were, and everyone who ever visited LIGO were kind of blown away by this great system that we had, but it wasn't good enough. So what can we do to isolate ourselves from the Earth even better? And that was a puzzle that we anticipated early, and we started developing the technology for it maybe 1999 or 2000. It took us about 10 years, and uh, then we were ready to use it. And the idea there is also a simple one that most of you know, and that is when you go on an airplane and the sounds of the engines bother you, if they bother you and you're worth spending and you are willing to spend a couple hundred dollars, you buy these earphones from Bose and you put them on your head and the sound from the engines pretty much dims out and the stewardess comes and asks you whether you want coffee or a drink or something and you hear her perfectly fine. So what is it doing? It basically is measuring the ambient sound, which is pretty uniform, 
from the engines. It's going, it's kind of roaring along. And then it puts in electronically, can, it cancels that sound. In the meantime, the sound from the steward is talking to you is not ambient, it's a pulse. So you hear her fine. Okay, so this has nothing to do, of course, with LIGO, but the same idea does. So what we want to do is make our uh, instrument more s isolated from the earth. So what we do, what we did was institute a whole array of seismometers inside the instrument. So after we're doing all this uh, shock absorber stuff and measure the ambient or residual motion of the earth. And it's harder than her case, than the case in the Bose case, because we have to tell what direction it is so that we can correct in that direction. It's a movement of the earth not audio. So we developed that system, very fancy system. It actually has an application if anyone could take our technology and make it cheap enough because we can make the world's most stable tables, say for microelectronics and so forth. So anyway, so we learned how to do this uh, and it gave us the extra factor of 100. So now I can show you the instrument and the result and then I'll have worn you out. This is the, we have two instruments, one situated in uh, Livingston, Louisiana, one in Hanford, Washington, and two institutions, Caltech and MIT, that built this. Uh, when we proposed it to the NSF, we were not allowed to tell them where we wanted to put it. They wouldn't let us. Uh, they wouldn't take our proposal if we did. But we tried to trick them by saying that we needed to study which the requirements were of a site so we put in two sites anyway, and we called them sample sites. Just a sample so this proposal would be realistic. One of them not so far from here, near the Edwards Air Force Base in Southern California, not so far from Caltech, of course. And the other one in Southern Maine, not so far from MIT. Went into the government, and uh, they rotated it by 45 degrees, but they gave us our money. And consequently, we got two very friendly senators who have helped us a lot, who helped us a lot through the years. So anyway, that's why, uh, in Hanford, Washington, it's on the large DOE reservation where the Hanford DOE uh, uh, nuclear facility is. And in Louisiana, it's in the middle of a huge uh, commercial pine forest. This is a picture of the two. The instruments are identical. The geography is very, very different. So it's high desert in Hanford, and it's, uh, as I said, uh, pine forest making mostly uh, cutting wood for paper in, uh, in Livingston. This is just to show you that inside of the laboratory, as you can see, there's big vats. These are under, everything's under vacuum. All those ports are so that we can put different instruments inside and get inside. And inside we have the lasers and the optics and the mirrors and all that stuff that make that a little more sophisticated than the picture you saw. This picture here is the actual optics. We have a mirror at the end and it's the best mirror ever made in the world. They have very fancy mirrors that are made for some telescopes. We had to have it even better than that so that we could focus this beam, laser beam over the four kilometers. Uh, if you look at this head on, it looks like just the prettiest piece. It's fused silica. It looks like the prettiest piece of glass you ever looked at. You see right through it. But that's because the laser beam is in the infrared and that's where we put a coating in to reflect it. For our eyes, it's just a beautiful piece of glass. They're also very expensive. Okay, now the science. So finally, we get this instrument ready. Uh, we put it together, and uh, that was 2015, and we turn it on. And when we turn it on, within days, we saw what I'm gonna show you next, which is the collision of two black holes. This picture here is not an artist's rendition. It's a graphical display of the calculations using Einstein's equations that match our data, done using general relativistic calculations. So these are two black holes. The two black holes, uh, let me explain because everybody sees the word black hole all the time, but let me re remind you what a black hole is. If I tried to remind you mathematically, it's pretty difficult. But let me conceptually remind you. A black hole is a region of space where gravity is so strong 
that nothing can get out, so we call it a black hole. By nothing getting out, we mean not even light. But remember, that makes sense because light gets bent in Einstein's theory. So in Einstein's theory, nothing gets out. It's a black hole. The concept of black holes was put forward by a scientist the same year as Einstein came out with general relativity um, in, in, uh, in 1915, 1960. So that's what a black hole is. Uh, they come about physically in nature. If you have a star and a star burns up all its fuel, it collapses eventually because of gravity. And if the star is big enough, it makes a black hole. Our sun, when it burns up all its, in, all its uh, nuclei, won't make a black hole because it's too small. But there are black holes in nature. The ones that I'm talking about come out, have, have come about from the collapse of a star. This is then, whoops, let me go back. This is then a movie made from the data of the first observation we made, the discovery of the, of the black holes. Ah, I should go back for it. I didn't go back far enough, one more. Okay, let me do, it, do this again. So this is the, using the data, making a pictorial representation from the fit to the data using Einstein's equations. And you'll notice as it goes around, at first it affects everything around it. That's the curvature of space and time, so that the light from these different objects is distorted. As they come together, they distort each other and eventually merge into one. This is happening over millions of years. They're going around each other. We capture the last part, the la in this case, the last two tenths of one second when they're merging together. And that's what I showed you, but I slowed it down in this uh, movie here. So the other thing is, as they're doing this, they're coming into each other because they're giving up some energy. That energy is going out in the form of gravitational waves, which we sh are showing here. And they've been passing through the universe, in the case of the one we observed, 1.3 billion years before they got to us. So we were ready 1.3 billion years later when it came to the Earth and then distorted space and time. So I exaggerated a little bit in this picture, <laughs> but uh, it basically exaggerated, uh, distorted space and time. We can't really measure it because it's too small on the Earth itself, so we have our instruments that uh, uh, measured that distortion. That was in September 2015. I don't have to show you very much data to show you that what it is. Those two black holes, if I put them on the map, one would be about in Palm Springs and the other in Los Angeles. And they're going around each other. In the time that we see them, one of them is about 30 times, 29 times the mass of our sun. The other one about 30 times, 36 times the mass of our sun. The size of each of them is not much bigger than Riverside. So that's 10 million times the mass of the Earth concentrated in a space the size of Riverside and another companion over in Santa Monica or something going around each other at about half the speed of light. It's kind of an unbelievable picture. They go around each other and we measure this effect that I, that I said. After 1.3 billion years, by the way, 1.3 billion years ago when this first happened, since I'm telling the story historically, on Earth, we were just evolving from single cell to multi-cell life. So that's when this story starts. Then it came to Earth. We caught up by the time it got here. And we're ready to see it. The first thing that happened is it came through the Southern Hemisphere. And we, know it, we knew this first one to that accuracy, that moon shape, period. We know that from the signal shape and the time the signals arrived in our two laboratories. Then it came through Livingston, Louisiana at 5 in the morning on September 14, 2015. And we get a signal that looks like this. On the, on the bottom is time. And that's 2 tenths of one second. And the vertical is in units, the whole thing, of 10 to the minus 21. So you're seeing a, a shaking signal that doesn't mean anything to you yet that is true, that is the size of 10 to the minus 21. We've been an instrument that can see something. So that's what we saw. Uh, turns out that if you were in the game, like I was, as soon as you see that, you know 
that it's supposed to, looks like it's supposed to, especially when you look seven milliseconds later and see the same, almost the identical signal 3,000 kilometers away in Hanford, Washington. Lastly, if I put a little line through it, which you probably can't see very well, a white line through it, the reason you can't see it very well is because it fits it so well, it's the calculations of Einstein for gravitational waves. So the signal immediately to us without doing any data analysis or anything was just like we had expected. So uh, that, was the, that was the discovery. This is a picture from Einstein of what the wave should look like. As it gets closer together, the signal gets bigger and higher frequency, which means narrower. This is time going to the right. The picture on the very top shows them far apart, getting closer together, eventually merging into one object. And on the bottom, you can see that we're able to tell the velocity of the objects. And during the time we measure them, they're going from about a third to six tenths the speed of light, so incredibly fast. I want to end. So that's the discovery. We've done more since, but that's not the subject of this uh, talk. I just want to talk about the future a little bit, not what we've done more. And the future is, in my mind, very analogous to what's happened in astronomy. In astronomy, the big gains in recent years and recent decades has been because people have learned to do astronomy and looking at the same phenomenon in different wavelengths, different frequencies. We began astronomy looking with our eyes, which is in the visible, but now we look in the infrared, the ultraviolet, and you combine all these different wavelengths to study the same phenomenon in different frequencies or different phenomena. The same thing will happen eventually for gravitational waves. We've been the first to see gravitational waves on the Earth's surface, and we look at very high frequencies. There's a space mission which is approved by the European Space Agency called LISA, which is under construction now and will fly roughly 10 or 15 years from now, this typical time it takes for a space mission. And it covers the region uh, that a phenomenon that take hours, ours take milliseconds. That will, they've proven the technology, it'll fly for sure, and that'll be uh, the next big step. Further, we have in space uh, accurate clocks. We call them pulsars. And we can study gravitational waves at even lower frequencies by seeing distortions of the time in those clocks from low frequency gravitation, gravitational waves going through. So just like in astronomy, I expect this is not going to happen tomorrow, but that will cover a large wavelength. And at the same time, the instruments will get more and more sensitive. The ultimate goal would be to see a picture like this one for gravitational waves. That's the picture that comes from studies of the cosmic microwave background and give us the most information we have about the development, the evolution of the universe from the expansion of the universe to the development from early times. But for photons, which is how we've done it, we can only get back to about 400,000 years after the Big Bang. We can't, we have to guess, do theory and so forth to predict what happened before that. We need a different probe to go to very earlier times. Uh, the two candidates to do that are neutrinos, which don't get absorbed so much, but it's probably not practical with neutrinos and gravitational waves, which I think will eventually be done. We can't do it yet, but it'll be done. So uh, where we are, I think, and we started talking about Galileo at the beginning, but I want to talk about Galileo in a little bit different way, that 400 years ago, he was the first one to study the heavens in, with something other than the naked eye, using, telescope, using a telescope for the first time. And of course, he looked at Jupiter, and he saw that Jupiter had four moons. That was a, his discovery, very much like us seeing the black hole merger, I think. If we look at the sky with electromagnetic radiation, which is what we've done for 400 years, you can imagine not much of what happens is luminous or gives electromagnetic radiation. So what we know, we think, is a lot about 
the universe is limited to something that gives signals that are electromagnetic. Gravity is everywhere. So if we can study the sky, as we will, using a totally different method, gravity, and we'll see the rest of the phenomenon that can't be seen with electromagnetic radiation with gravity. And I think uh, the pro progression of what we know about the universe give us another 400 years like they had in, in uh, electromagnetic radiation will be equally as impressive. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Barish. So now we will entertain a few questions. I, uh, if you have a question, please go to one of the microphones at the side corridors. Uh, since this uh, lecture is being recorded, Professor Barish will respond, uh, uh, before responding to the question, will repeat the question to ensure that everybody hears the question. I also ask that you limit your questions to a single one, please. Don't be shy. Hi, uh, really, really wonderful lecture. I'm gonna ask what may be a really stupid question, but my physics um, was a long, long time ago and also at Princeton University. Um, how often are black holes merging? And so you, you detected a black, black holes that merged that were doing it 1.3 billion years ago. Was this just pure luck? And, and, or are these merging all the time 1.3 billion years ago and, and you could have picked it up the week before, the week after, or whatever? Uh, since, let me repeat the question. The question is we saw one black hole merger. How kind of serendipitous was that? Or how often do they really happen? And uh, uh, were we just lucky or what? So let me respond to that. Uh, we don't have an accurate measure of how many there are, but the way we're able to detect anything, whether it's black holes or anything else, is, is dependent on how far we can look out into the universe. And at the present time, we can look out to see less than 10% of the universe looking for something like black holes. That means, since the universe is a volume, it means that we see one uh, one thousandth of the potential uh, black hole mergers that might be happening uh, in the universe. So for us, as we improve the detector, if we can look a factor of two out or 10 out further, we get many more events. We've seen at this stage 10, so not one, but 10. But for this audience, I didn't bring those up. We've also seen the merger of what are called neutron stars, a totally different phenomenon uh, within the last year. And that all happened in a second data run when we improved our sensitivity about a factor of two, which increases the rate a factor of eight because it's two cubed. Uh, we're just beginning our third data run as of today or yesterday. So. Uh, hopefully, it'll be as exciting. But to answer your question, we don't have an accurate number. We don't know how many were made in the... We don't know the evolution. So one thing is how much of the universe are we viewing. The second is when were they made? Were they made in the, near the early universe or later? That We need much more time to be able to tell that. And it's all still to be done. Thank you. Is, you mentioned in your lecture several times um, how you were relating your results to what was previously predicted in theoretical physics, physics by Einstein. I was wondering how the conversation between theoretical and experimental physics helps to inform both fields. Uh -huh. one, of, one of the beauties for me in being a physicist is the intimate interplay between theory and experiment. And uh, it, it's happened through ages, it's not just now, and that is that Sometimes experiments ahead of theory, and we're, we, we did that for 
tens of years in the 60s, 70s, and 80s when lots of new elementary particles were discovered, but nobody had any idea how to put it all together. And then theoretical physicists developed an idea called quarks, which put them together in some sort of family. Other times, theory is way ahead of experiment. In this case, the idea of gravitational waves came theoretically 100 years before we can do anything experimentally. This interplay back and forth is, um, is a, both very healthy and kind of unique in that, that uh, you don't even know which one's ahead of the other back and forth, which theories you can throw away because you did experiment, which experiments may be wrong, and you can tell that because it violates some theoretical principle. It's a very delicate and interesting interplay, and we really behave as one community. And so I think it's one of the real beauties of physics for me. Thank you. Space, besides black holes, are significant in discovering the nature of gravitational waves, in your opinion. What other? What other parts of space besides black holes are significant in discovering the nature of gravitational waves, okay. in your opinion? Uh, I, I, I think uh, the nature of gravitational waves is a little vague statement, so let me interpret it the way I want. It, the the uh, question was, what other, what other ways can we understand the nature of gravitational waves from these studies? I, I would say that there's it's not gravitational waves exactly, that's a tool, just like light's a tool. What we can understand are two things, I think, in, that are the deepest problems with studying gravitational waves in the future. The first is, what is the next level of understanding of, of gravity? I mentioned that early. And that is, as we start being able to measure things very well, well, we start seeing differences from Einstein's theory of gravity, which wasn't constrained by any experiments. It's not the only way you can write down a theory of gravity. So basically, understanding the deepest fundamental physics, one of our strong forces, gravity, is one answer. The other is what can we learn about astronomy from gravitational waves? And I'll give a third. The, what we can learn about astronomy or, or cosmology or whatever, I think is potentially understanding the early universe. I mentioned that, but the early universe, we all are curious about the early universe, or should be, because it turns out that from everything we know in nature, we shouldn't be here. Believe it or not, we shouldn't be here. It is every time we go in our labs and we use energy and we create particles, something we all know, Einstein taught us that we can make particles out of energy, we make an equal number of antiparticles and particles. Therefore, in the early universe, we made antimatter and we made matter, if we understand things, equally, and they should have annihilated each other. So how did we come out to have a totally matter-dominated uh, universe that we're living in? That's not understood by physicists at all. I, I'm hopeful that as we get, can actually probe the early universe, we can get some clues of what, what that is about. So early universe, the ability of gravitational waves to go back to the earliest times, I think is crucial if we want to know why we're here, as a, an example. Third one, which is maybe a, a conundrum for physicists, is that we have two fantastic theories of physics. We have something that's built up over 100 years called quantum physics, and it's developed in now the theories called quantum field theory that we use. It describes, no matter how hard we try, almost anything that happens when we have build a big collider like at CERN and collide these particles together, do all this exotic stuff, and it works beautifully. That's quantum physics. On the other hand, if we look at the distant universe, as far as we can tell, Einstein's equations work fantastically well. So we have two theories of physics, but physics is one subject. We should have one theory of physics. For years, people have tried to make a unified theory, but we don't have any, uh, in my mind, we don't have any clues. And people either haven't been clever enough or we don't know enough. So I think what we need is some guidance that would come from experiment. So how might that happen? I'll just hypothesize that a place where both quantum physics and uh, general relativity come to play in a big way is something we talked about tonight, black holes. In black holes, you have to convert, conserve all the 
conservation principles and so forth in quantum physics, at the same time, it's the strongest gravity that we have. So not just detecting black holes, I don't know how to do what I'm saying, but using black holes someday as a laboratory to understand and get some clues of what it is that is the real theory that can both do with the quantum nature and the, and the long distance uh, physics that Einstein's equations do is for the future. And maybe it's not black holes, but that's an idea. So, so the, uh, lastly, I think we don't have any idea what the rest of the, we see a small part, 4% or so of the, of the universe with luminous matter. So we don't know what's out there. So the unknown is, and that I can't tell you what it is, of course, because it's unknown. Thank you. Thank you. How do, how do we know that the gravitational force is the only factor that causes light to bend? How do we know that the gravitational force is the only? Factor that causes light to bend. Ah. I, that's, the, the question is, how do we know that gravitational for, force is the only thing that causes light to bend? We don't, but we do have uh, a consistent theory that if you have a massive object, it will cause light to bend. A massive object has gravitational fields. So it's a consistent theory, but like, all, uh, like I've tried to emphasize all night, there may be other effects that we don't know yet, but our ancestors will. I think it, the picture that we have is consistent because the bending of light that Einstein talked about was exactly a result of calculations of what would happen around massive bodies, but it doesn't say that's the only possibility. Thank you. We will entertain one last question, please. Um, I'm not sure if this was answered during the lecture, but how did Irving know that the orbits weren't quite, quite right, and what gave him the instinct to feel this way? Uh, well, th there was one, one of the, the question is how did uh, Urban Leverrier uh, know that the orbits weren't quite right uh, so that he had to do these calculations. He was, as I said, the father of celestial mechanics. He calculated, uh, for example, the amount that, mer that Mercury should move each time it went around. It's a calculation using all the planets and so forth. And uh, the answer was different than came from Newton's theory. Now, it could be different for lots of reasons. And as I said, it could be different for the reason that he hypothesized that uh, there was a missing planet. But it could have also been because Newton's theory was not really right. And it turns out, in this case, it was the latter. So we often have that kind of puzzle in physics that you see a discrepancy. It might be due to several possible reasons. And then it's our next job to try to understand which of these reasons, or maybe none of them, are the right reason for the discrepancy or problem that we find. The fact that he saw the problem, people did know the orbits of planets well enough in the 1800s to see that it uh, deviated, and they knew enough about the planets to calculate it. Please join me in thanking Dr. Barish again. Thank you for coming, and I hope you will join us next week for the next uh, lecture in the series.